So what's your number? Not your sleep number. Not your phone number. What's your number? How many times are you willing to forgive the same person? Depends, doesn't it? What they do. Well, are they sorry? Are they going to do it again? It all plays into the number. And for Peter, his number was seven. You know, and, and you have to realize that was very generous of him. He was living with 12 other guys whom he'd not chosen for his best friends. Yeah, one of them was his brother, Andrew, but I don't think that sweetened the deal. I mean, they all had these big personalities, and, and they had to have had their own personal quirks and, you know, just different things that made life kind of challenging and more than once. And then they had this ongoing rivalry among themselves of, as they jockeyed for position of who was the most important, the most powerful. And so, as you think about Peter asking this question, we, we tend to think of them as saints, because that's what we call them, you know, Saint Peter. But I don't think he was preparing a Bible lesson for the guys later that night around the fire. You know, it's like, you know, I want to do something on forgiveness, Jesus. What, what do you think? What angle should I take, you know? No! Imagine Peter looking right at the person he's talking about. <sighs> You know, and how many times, Jesus, what do you think? You know, he's angry at somebody specific and in view. And there it was. What do you, what do you think, Jesus? And it, his question really reveals a heart that was counting offenses. And at some point, and we all have that point, he was going to unleash a whole lot of something on whoever it was. You know, Jesus, at what point can I take this brother that I have, who I know I have to love and cherish and treat nice, at what point is it, like, enough? And now I can treat him as a wicked, evil jerk that he is. You know, all of this just bubbles up from a heart that thinks that such behavior, it's right to do that because they deserve it. You know, we, we live in a world that, that goes by this, this operating system that says people get what they deserve. And we both good, but and bad. You know, you just, you do things and then you get things. And you get what you deserve. And so it really wasn't unusual, the question Peter asked. I think we all kind of live at some point with that question because that's how this world is. But that's not how the upside-down kingdom of Jesus works at all. That's not how life is with Jesus. And Jesus challenged Peter and called him out and his number. If this kind of feelings flow out of you, these kinds of words and behaviors, if that's really what you believe inside of you, that people really should get what they deserve, Jesus warned Peter and his disciples that his heavenly Father will treat them exactly the same. Like, oh, <laughs> really? I mean, even for us, we're like, oh, that doesn't sound good, right? That sounds bad. Really, Jesus, the Father's going to treat us that, like that? And so now you've got our attention. We, we're listening. What are you going to say now? Because we have some questions for you. We have some real objections that we need answers from you right now. Like, what about justice? You know, righting the wrongs. What about, you know, protecting yourself from the, from the person who's doing all this bad to you? I mean, if you're just going to keep forgiving and forgiving and letting them off and there's no limit to it, what will keep your brother or sister from just taking advantage of you? 
you know, think about it. How, how many times must a wife forgive her husband for ignoring her until he wants something? For his belittling comments, put-downs, sarcasm. How many times must a 10-year-old forgive the cruel taunts of his classmates? How many times must a female employee forgive the unwelcome advances and crude comments of her male co-workers and superiors? How many times must a church volunteer forgive the criticisms of what they're doing to serve the Lord? Wouldn't have done it that way. Who does she think she is? She's always like that. When we have been harmed, yeah, it's a legitimate concern for justice. Wrongs should be righted. Protection from harm should be done. All of that, yes. Do not disagree with it one bit. But I do want to ask you this question. After all that's been done, does withholding forgiveness bring justice? Does making them pay bring a better marriage? A better friendship at school with those who would taunt? A better congregational life? Now, easy here. We're not saying that forgiveness means there's no confrontations, there's no making wrongs right, there, there's no, no, no. Forgiveness doesn't mean you just got to suck it up and take it, whatever it is, or God's going to get you. That's not how Jesus presented his answer to Peter at all. No, Jesus told a very telling parable that begins with a face-to-face -face confrontation. Calls to account. The king does. All those who owe debts. Hey, what you owe is now you got to pay it up. Because what you've been doing is wrong. Your debt's way out of line. 10,000 talents is about $600 million. I mean, it's more than any human being could pay at that time. It was beyond payment. What you did was wrong. And there needs to be a change. It wasn't just expected. It was demanded. So, don't think that forgiveness somehow means acceptance or permission. But after you've kind of worked through that, after you kind of, okay, all right. But also keep in mind that this demand for justice, you know, the wrongs being righted that you have, you feel very right about that, that it also may be preventing you from seeing a more basic reason that you're counting forgiveness. And that you're limiting it. This normal, natural demand for to make things right may very well be hiding just out of view something that you really have to really have to go after and look at it. Because without it, you'll just dismiss these words of Jesus as pious, but not very practical. And so in that moment, it is your emotions. When, when the offense has happened, that's the telltale of what you're really thinking. Your emotions betray your thinking. Because in that moment, when someone has offended you, isn't there a certain sense of outrage? That it was me. How dare you do this to me? And as you consider what's really going on with your emotions, and, and you're maybe not the kind of person that's going to make a big deal about it, but you're just going to avoid that person. You're going to talk about that person. You're never going to be of an open heart to that person again because you're going to make them pay. You realize your emotions are telling you what you're really thinking. Your thinking is not justice, but vengeance. Think about, that's really what happened next in this parable that Jesus told. Remember, the, the one servant, he finds his, his fellow servant who owed him a few bucks, right? And what does he do? Oh, 
He grabs him, chokes him, demands, pay me what you owe. It's like, that's pretty violent, right? You know, okay. Why, why so violent? Because there is a violence in us. There is a hatred in us that this has happened to me and I'm going to do something about it. If you find yourself counting how many times you'll forgive, what you're really counting up to isn't your limit, but when you finally can unleash this violence that's in you and not feel bad about it, you're justified in it. Look what they did. Look what you just made me do. You know. There it is. When you really look at it, it's kind of ugly. So we don't normally. We normally keep it out of view. Well, I'm not like that. Well, are there people in your life you don't want to talk to? Are there people in your life you've cut out and you feel justified by that? You see, the, this is where the king comes in, right? This is the last part of the parable. And the king, he loses it, right? When he hears what that servant who had been forgiven, this great, enormous, unpayable debt, he just forgave it and did not pay it forward, he lost it. Bring him in. He was just dismayed that this, this had not changed his heart. That he was still operating with the same the same belief that people should get what they deserve even though he hadn't. Jesus said, my heavenly Father is going to lose it on everyone who has received his mercy but has not been and has refused the change of heart that comes with that mercy. It's a package deal. Anytime you receive that kind of mercy, it comes with a change of heart, but you can refuse it. He says anyone who has refused this, he's going to lose it. Now, if Jesus told this to his 12 disciples, Peter, James, John, and the rest, does it not certainly also apply to, to us? And so let a godly fear fall on your soul right now and let it focus your attention on these words that forgiveness is not optional. You can't just take it or leave it. As you hear these words and there is a godly fear also realize that they are impossible. Forgiveness is impossible in this world with its belief that people should get what they deserve. You can't have that and that belief of deserve. See, it's only possible in the upside-down kingdom of Jesus. It's only possible with life with Jesus because there is the power and the grace to forgive because, and this is really key, if you haven't listened to anything, listen to this, all right, because you've received something new to believe. Old belief, people should get what they deserve. New belief, I have not gotten what I deserved, but justice has been played out in the body of Jesus, in the nails and the thorns, in the rod and the scourge, in the taunts, in the forsaking of the Father to the Son. That my enormous, unpayable debt against God, the King, has been removed by the payment of the priceless life of Jesus on the cross. Pity, mercy, forgiveness have replaced deserved condemnation by the, the condemning of Jesus to hell. This is a faith. It is something new to believe. It's been given to you as a gift in your heart with the mercy that God gives to you in the forgiveness of all your sins, you get a new heart in the resurrection life of Jesus in His upside-down kingdom. 
It's what's believed. And now your life is marked by this kind of undeserved giving of forgiveness, just like Jesus, to those who may very well not deserve your forgiveness. This is the Christian faith. There's no other faith on the earth like it. You're not going to find this with karma. That's you get what you deserve. You're not going to find this in the Muslim faith. You're going to find this anywhere other than Jesus. He gives you something new to believe right now. That you have received your enormous debt and a new heart to live out this forgiveness. Now, I, this is really awesome and amazing and powerful and you got to take it home and put it into practice for those old offenses. You've been steaming about stuff since childhood. You have people you've cut out of your life. For old offenses and new wounds, I have a take-home card for you. And what I'm going to encourage you to do, and this is going to sound really strange from a Lutheran, but go buy a crucifix and put it in your home. Or download a picture of one. Put it on your phone, your iPad, whatever. And then look at it. Prayerfully meditate on, on the enormous price that's been paid because you're loved that much. And as you meditate and think on this enormous gift, ask and pray that God would work in your heart the removal of vengeance, the removal of this, this belief that people should get what they deserve and they have a specific person in mind. Now you'll know that the Holy Spirit's working in your heart when you can be around those people that you vowed never to be around again. Now that doesn't mean you go make yourself in a dangerous spot. Somebody's abused you. You don't go back there. But normally people that we have cut out of our life aren't going to hurt us. They're just annoying us. And they're making us mad. You'll know that this Jesus is working in you an upside down kingdom when your heart is tender again against those people right now that you're hard and set that you'll never. Well, that's, that's a gift that Jesus has for you. Imagine our congregation if we were the kind of people that had this kind of love and forgiveness to give to one another because we blow it with each other and we keep blowing it and we're going to keep blowing it. Do, don't kid yourself, all right? There's new sins waiting. Your family is the same way. At work, it's the same way. Without the upside-down kingdom, you've got nothing but giving people what they deserve. But here, you are light, you are salt, you are people of Jesus. And it's attractive, it's beautiful, because He is. May God bless you as you take this gift Rejoice and honor God in it and love your neighbor. Amen. I invite you to stand and confess the faith together. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to Jesus.